This pie graph represents my entire annual carbon footprint. It's a running tally of all the ways my day-to-day -day actions produce greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. And for better or for worse, my footprint is pretty different than the average person's. So here's a breakdown. My partner and I live in a small apartment, and even before COVID times, we've always worked from home. On a typical day between the lights, the dishwasher, our computers, and so on, the two of us use nine and a half kilowatt hours of electricity. That's a bit less than a typical North American apartment, and it's three times less electricity usage than in a typical standalone home. The big thing to ask about your electricity is where is it coming from? Now, it depends a lot on where you live, but in most places in the US, electricity is generated by burning fossil fuels. It makes up 63% of the total electricity generated in the country. So the carbon footprint of your refrigerator is going to be a lot worse if you live in, say, fossil-fueled Colorado than in hydro-powered Washington. Here in British Columbia, Canada, 90% of our electricity comes from hydropower. So my daily use of electricity only makes up about 1% of my carbon footprint. Of course, electricity is not the only source of emissions from our home. We have a gas stovetop, we have hot water, and we have heating and air conditioning, which is typically a huge contributor to the emissions of most Canadian homes. But our apartment is weird and awesome. A lot of our heat is actually recovered heat from sewage at a nearby facility. Our apartment is in one of the most sustainable buildings in the world, and I want to make a video about it at some point. Also, at around 650 square feet, our apartment is nearly four times smaller than the average house being built in America right now. So our entire home energy footprint is really small. It makes up only 4% of my carbon footprint. It's worth noting that carbon footprints are only estimates and they can go up or down quite a bit depending on what things you decide to account for. I've tried to be very consistent in this video, though I hope that if you make it to the end of the video, you'll know that I didn't make this video to brag about my tiny carbon footprint. The next biggest thing in my carbon footprint is something that's rarely ever even accounted for, and I think it's something that's generally pretty poorly understood, so I didn't have a lot of information to go off of, and this is basically my best guess. When you invest money in something, you help that thing exist. They use your money, your capital, to help run and grow their business, and if a company grows, you also benefit. The thing is, unless you are really careful about where you're investing your money in, it's going to be funding oil and gas companies. For example, experts estimated that investing $10,000 in the Toronto Stock Exchange Index has an annual carbon footprint of 800 kilograms of CO2. That's the equivalent of driving a car 3,000 kilometers. It's complicated and it's different for everyone and I'm not about to give financial advice, but I just want to acknowledge that my investment footprint is maybe somewhere around 500 kilograms of CO2 per year, even after trying my best to divest from fossil fuels. Now I've paid someone to do that for me, but if you're more financially savvy, then my partner recommends checking out the blog, The Sustainable Economist. Moving on, I mostly bike. Vancouver is excellent for biking. And we don't commute, we don't own a car, we do sometimes use car share programs, which are great for big grocery hauls or for going hiking. All told, I drive about 780 kilometers a year and burn up about 140 kilograms of emissions on the road. I also take the ferry a few times a year, and pretty rarely the bus, but the carbon footprint from those vehicles is shared by all the passengers, so that works out to be pretty small for each person. All told, my about town transportation is about 10% of my carbon footprint. In terms of goods, I mostly buy stuff used, and I haven't counted that in my carbon footprint. When I do buy new things, which I absolutely hate doing. I try to buy high quality stuff that will last as long as possible. I take care of my things, I repair them, and I use them or wear them well past when is considered socially acceptable to do so. But still, 
I buy new shoes and things, and that comes with a carbon footprint. It takes energy to get those raw materials, to manufacture them into goods, to ship them to a store near me, to keep the lights on in the store, and so on. So that's 12% of my carbon footprint. The meal I eat more than any other is a bowl of oatmeal, which I have pretty much every morning. When you consider all the fuel from all the farm machinery that worked to produce it, the emissions from the fertilizer, the emission from the food processing, this little bit of oats grown in Saskatchewan have a carbon footprint of around 41 grams of carbon dioxide. I add some raisins, which is actually the biggest contributor to the bowl's carbon footprint, a scoop of peanut butter, and a dash of Canadian maple syrup. It also takes about 70 kilowatt hours of electricity for the kettle to boil the water. All told, about 320 grams of carbon dioxide were emitted in order to make this single bowl of oatmeal. However, compared to a breakfast sandwich of bacon, eggs, and cheese, which comes to a whopping total of 1,441 grams of emissions, my oatmeal breakfast is pretty great. On average, I eat about 2,900 calories of vegan food each day, which means that my annual carbon footprint from my diet is about one and a half tons. In general, eating a plant-based diet instead of a typical diet of meat and animal products can slash your carbon footprint from the food you eat in half. I plan to make a whole video about that soon. I'll leave the link when it's done. Okay, so there's only one last part of this graph, which is kind of depressing because it makes up almost exactly half of my annual carbon footprint. The single biggest contributor to my carbon footprint was a single trip on a plane. Why wasn't that part of transportation, you ask? Well, that's a valid question. Moving on. Anyway, most years I fly halfway across Canada to visit my parents. At the start of this year, I flew to Asia to visit my sister and my partner's family. Flying is incredibly bad for the climate for a few reasons. I mean, it just takes a lot of energy, a lot of fuel to get what is essentially a building off the ground and into the air. And when you burn that fuel high in the atmosphere, it puts greenhouse gases exactly in the place where they do the most damage. Also, airplanes just make it possible to go extremely long distances very cheaply in a short amount of time. If it always took people two weeks to get from Vancouver to Tokyo, as it does by boat, then people wouldn't be doing it on a whim. I refuse to fly for work and I don't fly for tourism. I only fly to visit family. And for the planet, I try to space those trips far apart and stay longer when I go. Still, it accounts for half my carbon footprint and that makes it a tough decision for me. I mentioned at the start of this video that my footprint is not like the average person's. For comparison, this is the breakdown for the average American's carbon footprint. I'm Canadian, but this is the data we're working with, okay? This fluctuates a little bit depending on what you account for, but on average, the typical American emits around 19 tons of carbon dioxide every year. Now, as you can see, I'm doing quite a bit better than the average American, but it would be misleading to just show you this comparison and leave it at that. So here are some other footprints. The average person in China has a footprint of around 6.4 tons, smaller than mine. In India, it's only 1.7 tons. However, if we're going to have any chance of keeping the planet below two degrees of warming by the end of the century, then this is the carbon footprint that everyone on the planet would have to immediately adopt. And that brings us to one of the two reasons why focusing solely on changing people's carbon footprints is fundamentally broken. If I didn't take that trip to Asia, then my carbon footprint would be almost exactly half the size. It'd be pretty close to the best case scenario for emissions for someone living in Canada, and it would still be more than double where we need to be. For example, it doesn't matter very much if I drive an electric car if the electricity for that car is generated by burning fossil fuels. So frankly, unless you're very rich or you're making some very bad decisions, then focusing on your carbon footprint instead of trying to change the system through voting or pushing for climate action, that's just like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And maybe that's why the entire idea of the carbon footprint was popularized not by environmentalists, but by the fossil fuel company 
British Petroleum, which ran a big ad campaign in 2005. And that's called misdirection. In order to solve climate change, we need system change. And your carbon footprint does not account for things like how you vote. And that might be the single most important thing that you can do for the climate. And the other reason that focusing solely on carbon footprints just doesn't work is this. Hold on, hold on. This circle is the amount of emissions generated by one single person. This is Paris Hilton's carbon footprint. And if that looks huge, I should clarify, this is just her emissions from flying, which is to say nothing of the emissions from her millions of dollars of investments or the carbon footprint from her multiple mansions. I can only speculate, but I'd guess it's a lot bigger than this. The rich skew the average carbon footprint because the richest 10% of the people in the world are responsible for 50% of the world's emissions. And millionaires and billionaires have the biggest carbon footprint of them all. And they also have the means of protecting themselves against the worst parts of climate change. And I doubt this is shocking, but they are not holding themselves accountable. We just can't rely on them to shrink their own carbon footprints. We can only rely on them to make the average a lot larger. In the West, we sort of want to solve everything through individual action, and I think maybe that's part of the reason why we are so terribly failing at taking action on climate. So sure, do what you can to have a smaller impact on the environment, to shrink your carbon footprint. Um, I'll leave some links in the video description that might be helpful. I mean, that that's great, but if you are not voting for climate action, if you are not taking serious steps to change the systems that we live in, then I think you're missing the point. Thanks for watching.